welcome to the combined class. There's 27 of us, which is pretty good. Um, I'm excited to introduce to you Will Carnahan from the FDR International Park up in New Brunswick, on Campobello Island. I appreciate his willingness to come and do this for us. He has some stories to tell. He's got some videos to share, and I think you're going to enjoy the next while with him. A, because you want to listen to me talk for an hour or two hours, it'll be someone else. So, Will Carnahan, take it away. Thank you very much for being here. Well, thanks, Mike. Uh, thanks very much for having me. Um, what's going to happen is I'm going to show you uh, some wonderful uh, photos, historic and contemporary, of uh, Roosevelt Campobello International Park. And I'll speak to the Roosevelt's time there, the history of the park, and how the park is governed. And then uh, what I've done is I've asked uh, four of my guide staff. I'm the manager of interpretation at Roosevelt Park, and I manage a staff of about uh, 28 guides. Uh, you, you would commonly refer to them as park rangers. And uh, we have a very interesting program called uh, Eleanor's Tea. And uh, our guide staff tell the life story uh, of activism of Eleanor Roosevelt uh, while weaving in their own stories. Many of them are fourth and fifth generation islanders on Campobello Island. And, uh, you know, it's a very, very popular program. Uh, we, we go out and deliver it. We were going to uh, deliver it right in your classroom. Uh, but then this uh, uh, pandemic started and we had to get creative. So as you can imagine, on Campobello Island, the internet is not the best. Uh, the Wi-Fi signals are not that great, uh, but I've asked four of my guides to film themselves uh, sort of delivering their favorite stories from tea. So uh, after I ramble on for a bit, we'll take a look at that video. But as Mike said, if you have any questions um, at any time, just uh, unmute yourself and, and shoot away, and I'll do my best to answer them. I'm going to uh, uh, share my screen. And when I do that, if someone could just give me a thumbs up that uh, they can see the, the screen okay. So here we go. Is that uh, okay? Yes. Yeah. Right. Very nice. Okay. Excellent. So this, of course, is uh, Roosevelt Cottage, not your typical cottage uh, at Roosevelt Campobello International Park. And uh, basically, in the late 1800s, uh, what we call commonly referred to as the rusticators, uh, or you might refer to them as cottagers, or uh, here in New Brunswick, we call them PFAs. If anyone knows what that is, people from away, people. summer people. Yeah. Uh, in the late 1800s, um, the rusticators come to uh, Campobello Island. And uh, this is a movement of, uh, you know, relatively wealthy individuals that are leaving the cities of uh, Philadelphia, New York, Montreal, Boston. And uh, they're beginning the concept of vacationing. Uh, they want to go where the breezes are good, and they believe that this will help them with uh, any diseases of the lungs, which is kind of fitting for our contemporary times. It's, uh, you know, one of the main reasons people uh, vacation nowadays is, uh, you know, to uh, improve their health. So, you know, for example, a lot of snowbirds go, what we call snowbirds here in New Brunswick, go down to Florida for the good weather. And it, uh, as my dad used to say, it helps my arthritis. So, uh, this would be a typical example of the Roosevelt's having a picnic on Campobello Island. As you can uh, see from the scenery here, uh, it's very similar to the, uh, the down east coast of Maine. And in the late 1800s, three entrepreneurs out of Boston uh, form a company called the Campobello Company. And they build three magnificent resort hotels, uh, as you can see here. They use a Welsh name because the Welsh predominantly settled Campobello. And uh, they call it the Tinny, Tinny Maze and the Tinny Coed and the Owen House. And as you can see, these are massive, beautiful old resort hotels. Uh, I believe they um, had about 300 rooms between the three hotels. And they were often booked solid. 
It was a very popular place. And in the late 1800s, Sarah and James Roosevelt come and they bring a little man. And this little man is about one years old at the time. And of course it's Franklin. And uh, they stay at one of the hotels, the Tinney Maze, and they absolutely fall in love with Campobello Island. They love, this is good for James Roosevelt, Franklin's father. They believe this is helping uh, one of his illnesses, uh, being in the ocean breeze and the uh, stiff air of Campobello. And uh, they quickly buy some property and they build their own cottage, which we call the Granny Cottage or Sarah and James Roosevelt Cottage. Now, as I said, Franklin is a young man when he comes to Camp Bello. This is a, a picture of Franklin uh, at the wheel for the first time in his life. Uh, I believe he's about two or three years old in this picture. And this is where Franklin learns how to sail. And in fact, he's going out on sailboats and fishing boats with the fishermen of Camp Bello when he's as young as two and three years old. Passamaquoddy Bay, the Bay of Fundy, has the highest tides in the world some of the most trickiest sailing waters on the East Coast can be found uh, just within sight of Roosevelt Cottage. And this is where young Franklin uh, learns how to sail. Now, of course, um, as I'm sure you'll learn in this course, or you might already know, Franklin goes on to become Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and he's actually famous on Campobello. While he's Assistant Secretary of the Navy, he uh, hops a ride on many different destroyers, and uh, catches a ride to his summer cottage, which is uh, an incredibly great way to travel, <laughs> if you can do it. Uh, he'll put his own sailboats onto these destroyers, and he himself will navigate the destroyers, captain the ships, if you will, through the tricky Lubeck Narrows and just off the dock of Roosevelt Cottage. And in fact, on one of these treks, uh, a young captain is reluctant to do this, and Franklin pushes him aside and takes control and navigates through. Now that young captain's name is Halsey. And he goes on, of course, to become Admiral Halsey, a very famous World War II Admiral. And uh, they form a, a close working relationship through, throughout the Second World War. So uh, what do the Roosevelts do at Roosevelt's cottage? on Camp Abello Island, New Brunswick? Well, they do whatever anyone does at their summer cottage. They engage, engage in leisure activities. And uh, one of Franklin's famous pastimes is hiking, or what we call paper chases or scavenger hunts. And he took great delight in pranking all of his summer guests. So he would send them on these paper chases and scavenger hunts throughout the island. And he would send them places where he knew the tide was coming in and they would be stranded, so to speak. Oh. <laughs> and he would have to then come and rescue them. And this is uh, Franklin wearing his beautiful white pants and what I call the Bing Crosby hat uh, as he engages on his favorite hike. And this is uh, a place on Campbell Bell Bellow known as Friar's Head. Now, as you can see, uh, Franklin engaged in all sorts of athletic activities. He was a, a very active young father um, at his cottage. He would sail, play tennis, uh, canoe. And in fact, this is a famous canoe that we have at the park. And when you come to visit, you'll be able to see this canoe. It was a gift to Franklin uh, from Chief Tama Joseph, who uh, was a famous uh, uh, chief of the Passamaquoddy tribe uh, in the main area and uh, quite an artist. And if you look carefully at the, the front of the canoe, you'll see that Tama Joseph put his spirit animal, uh, it engraved it on the, on the front of the canoe there, which is a dan dancing owl. And he, he wanted Franklin to remember the location, to remember the people that he was interacting with, because Franklin came from wealth and was different than the regular islanders uh, to Tama Joseph, and Tama always wanted him to remember the splendor of this natural location. And so he engraved that on the front of the canoe there. So I'm gonna go through rapidly a series of slides that will show you the uh, type of activity that the Roosevelts engaged in on Campobello. In the background of this picture, you can see uh, a cottage there. 
So you get the idea of the types of cottages that were being built in the late 1800s. And in fact, around 21 cottages are built at that time. And they form kind of a little summer colony, if you will. Now, Franklin uh, has learned about the game of golf from his father. They picked it up uh, on a, a trip to France, I believe. And Franklin absolutely falls in love with the game of golf. And he forms, helps to form the first uh, golf course on uh, uh, Roosevelt uh, Camp Bello International Park. And I'm proud to say he, he starts the very first golf tournament, which of course he himself wins. And if we know anything about politicians, they love to win their own tournaments. Franklin was no different. Uh, and uh, he, if that tournament actually continues to this day. We have a championship golf course. It's actually at our sister park, the Provincial Park, which is called Herring uh, Cove Provincial Park. And uh, we sponsor the uh, FDR Cup. And uh, that's, that's been going since the late 1800s. So it's pretty remarkable. Interesting thing about Franklin, even though he gets polio, he becomes paralyzed, he goes on to become president, during the Depression, uh, with the work of the WPA, he creates over 300 golf courses, which are still, many of them still functioning today in the United States. So we know that this was a game that he dearly loved, not as much as sailing, but it was a, a very close passion to him. And uh, we're thrilled that he, you know, he experienced this game on Campobello Island. Of course, sailing. Uh, Franklin becomes a master sailor, uh, you know, certainly one of the most gifted navigators on the East Coast, uh, and it, it's rare for a president to have that type of skill. I think perhaps Jack Kennedy and maybe Ted Kennedy um, shared that kind of passion for sailing, and uh, Franklin was uh, blessed with that skill. Uh, and as you can see, it was uh, kind of a carefree life for, uh, and I'm sure Mike probably will talk about this at some point in your course, but during his uh, New York life, he was uh, uh, quite sheltered. And, uh, and I, I believe he couldn't even go outside without a chaperone. Where on Campobello Island, he was allowed to be free, um, you know, and he would roam the island hiking, playing tennis, playing golf, sailing with his friends. Uh, this in fact is one of his cousins. And uh, you know, like any, family cottage, they would have extended family coming up for uh, all sorts of wonderful vacations. And here we get a sense of the playful nature of Franklin. He's often uh, remarked as a wonderful man to know, but impossible to really know. He was quite a guarded individual, but outwardly was very gregarious. And uh, we believe he got a sense of that island hospitality that we like to talk about uh, on Campobello. And of course, these, these shots just show his, his love of sailing. And uh, I believe this is uh, the Viero. Um, I think it's been reserved and is in the Mystic, uh, I think it's the Mystic Marine Museum or, or Seaport Museum in Connecticut. Uh, so that, that is a, a, a yacht that we would dearly, uh, dearly love to get our hands on, but uh, obviously quite, quite expensive with a presidential pedigree. Uh, but it was uh, the family yacht that was uh, manufactured specifically for sailing on Passamaquoddy Bay. Okay. Uh, tennis, these are uh, some of the other uh, um, rusticators at the time. And uh, you'll begin to notice in these pictures, a very young, beautiful woman starts to show up. And her name, of course, is Eleanor, Eleanor Roosevelt. And she's directly behind Franklin in this picture. She's very shy and often in these early pictures, <laughs> She won't look she at the camera. In fact, her mother was quite mean to her during her childhood and referred to her as granny and told her that she wasn't very good looking, so she was going to have to make up for it uh, with intellect. I happen to believe that Eleanor Roosevelt is a beautiful woman, and uh, as these early photographs indicate, you'll see the, the kind of natural charm that she had, even if she was a little bit shy. Uh, this, of course, is one of my favorite photos. Uh, the Bay of Fundy and, and certainly most of the coast of uh, uh, down east Maine, not famous for swimming. Don't think you'd want to be swimming in those waters. <laughs> it's pretty darn cold. But uh, Franklin and Eleanor and all of the rusticators believed that it would help them 
and uh, they swam. They certainly swam right in Passamaquoddy Bay. This is a photograph right on the beach. Um, and uh, I don't know, I, I think it speaks to the, the natural charm and, uh, and uh, beauty of the area. Any questions so far? Okay, I'll keep going. Okay, so Roosevelt Park today. Uh, today we have preserved five of the historic cottages and we use them for a variety of different programs. Um, in 1909, the Kuhn family, uh, this wasn't a Roosevelt cottage to begin with, it was the Kuhn family cottage. Mrs. Kuhn passed away and Sarah Roosevelt purchased it for $5,000 to be a wedding gift for Franklin and Eleanor. Now, I don't know what you all got for your wedding, but I didn't get a cottage like this. And it is a magnificent beauty. Uh, it's designed by uh, an architect, uh, Willard T. Sear. He's a famous architect. He designed the uh, Gardner Museum in Boston. And uh, it's kind of an arts and crafts style. Uh, now the section you're seeing on the left there uh, with the green awning, uh, you can tell is slightly ahead of the rest of the cottage. It, it sits slightly forward. That's because that was an addition. As Franklin and Eleanor's family begins to grow, they build an addition on their family cottage to, uh, to house all of the children. And of course, this is a famous photograph of the family um, on the steps of Roosevelt Cottage. Now, we often say the only... Uh, Happiness in this uh, picture is, of course, Chief the dog. Everyone else looks really gloomy in this picture. And there's a reason for that. This photograph was taken in 1921. And uh, I believe it was a series of photographs that were to make Franklin look more statesman-like. Uh, he's about to embark on his vice presidential run at this point, I believe. And of course, the kids just want to play. They don't want to be sitting for political photographs. Eleanor, again, very shy of the camera, but there's a very uh, interesting element to this photograph that I love. And if you look closely, Franklin's mother is sitting in the middle. And if you look closely at her left hand, I think it's very telling what's going on there. At this time, there was some trouble in the uh, relationship. Uh, it's well documented. Franklin had had an extramarital affair and uh, it was made very clear to him that the best course of action for him would be to rectify this situation, stay with his family and stay with his wife. And uh, this is the beginning of, the beginning of a turning point uh, in Eleanor's uh, life. And uh, we, at the park, we feel that that simple gesture of the hand on the knee um, between two people who are, you know, it's well documented, they had a rocky relationship as well, Sarah and Eleanor, um, is very telling. Of course, Franklin returns to uh, Camp Abello after his first hundred days in office. Now, if you can imagine, he sails up the coast uh, with his family to his cottage in New Brunswick, Canada, after his first 100 days in office. And often, Franklin's first 100 days in office are, are kind of seen, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Americans, as the high bar for uh, what you can accomplish as a president. He certainly managed to, I think he pushed through about 82 pieces of legislation in his first 100 days. I mean, I don't think any president can push through 82 pieces of legislation now in uh, their entire presidency. So it's quite remarkable uh, what he did manage to achieve uh, in his first hundred days. And sort of as a celebration, he comes back to Campobello and uh, there he is sailing up uh, the coast with his family and friends. And Eleanor throws an island-wide weenie rope uh, on the back steps of Roosevelt Cottage. And I'm sorry that this photograph is a little blurry, but in the back, you'll see the officers uh, from the USS Indianapolis. So he sails up the coast, but he's followed closely by the USS Indianapolis, which harbors 
uh, just out in Passamaquoddy Bay, Eleanor throws an island-wide weenie roast. And there are um, descendants of islanders that um, attended that weenie roast that I still work, I work with at the park. So that legacy, um, you know, has lasted even until the year 2020, which is something uh, pretty amazing. <clears throat> now I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Uh, Franklin returns to the cottage in 1933, 1936, and 1939. And these are all sort of momentous uh, years in American history. We have the Great Depression, the, the uh, lead up to the uh, Second World War. And uh, these are, you know, huge moments in history. And, uh, you know, we feel kind of special that Franklin was there sitting on the back porch of his cottage. And when you sit on the back porch of Roosevelt Cottage, you look across the bay to Eastport, Maine. And uh, we believe he, you know, he took some time to make some big decisions and uh, look out back across at his uh, country. And uh, we're privileged. Um, what happens in the 1940s during the war, the Roosevelts don't really come to the cottage. Eleanor uh, uses it for a student retreat. So kind of a student leadership conference is held at the cottage. Eleanor does attend that during the war. Uh, but then it, uh, in the 1950s, after Franklin passes away in 1945, in the early 1950s, the cottage is sold to the uh, Hammer Brothers. And they own it for about 10 years. And then uh, Eleanor has a, a very interesting tea uh, with uh, President Kennedy at that time. Actually, he's running for office at that time. They have an interesting tea at another one of their homes, uh, Val Kill. Uh, cottage uh, and in Hyde Park, New York. And Kennedy needs all the support that he can get from every available Democrat for the 1960 election. And Eleanor would like to see Roosevelt uh, Cottage turned into a memorial for Franklin. So we believe that the seeds of the International Park are sown during that meeting. Now, of course, we have no documentation to prove that. We don't know what was said, but we do know this. After the tea, Kennedy comes out stronger for civil rights, gets Eleanor's backing, and very shortly after that, he wins the election and uh, Roosevelt Park uh, is formed. Unfortunately, Kennedy doesn't get to make it to the opening. He is uh, assassinated, of course, in Dallas. But um, President Johnson, uh, the Queen Mother, who is a good friend, of course, of the Roosevelts, and uh, Eleanor uh, um, managed to uh, see the park formed. And this is a picture of Franklin, or sorry, of Eleanor in 1962. Her last visit to Roosevelt Cottage uh, was when they actually dedicated the bridge. And I believe I have a picture of the bridge here. Nope. <laughs> no, I don't. But the, uh, later on, you'll see a picture of that bridge. Um, she comes up to Roosevelt Cottage for the last time to help uh, dedicate the bridge. And in fact, is the uh, first person to cross over the bridge. Now the bridge goes from Lubeck, Maine to Campobello Island. And even today, it's our only way to get back to Canada. So we have to cross over the bridge drive through the state of the great state of Maine all the way up to St. Stephen, New Brunswick uh, to get back to Canada. So we have a ferry that operates in the summertime, but it doesn't operate year round. So uh, our only lifeline really is this wonderful FDR Memorial Bridge that goes from Campobello Island to Lubeck, Maine. And now even uh, under this global pandemic, the islanders travel across the bridge and are allowed entry into the United States to buy their groceries and gas, et cetera, and go back to uh, Campobello Island. Now the park today offers many uh, interpretive programs. And one of them I mentioned already is uh, Eleanor's Tea. And this is one of my guides, Jade Robbins, uh, delivering tea. We have a beautiful restored cottage. It's called the Wells Shober Cottage. And uh, we deliver uh, tea twice a day to, uh, it's often sold out. Uh, 40 people uh, each time, and uh, guides basically tell the story of uh, Eleanor's life and uh, their own life 
on Campobello Island. Uh, the park offers all kinds of interpretive programs. Uh, this is an example uh, in the background, pardon me. <coughs> in the background is the uh, visitor center of the park. And our guests gather out front for many different interpretive programs. This is called the Fun Tour. Fantastic, unbelievable, definitely not ordinary. All of our tours are highly participatory, non-didactic. We believe in having fun. We believe in showing people what the Roosevelt's did when they were on Campobello, why it's important, and what a wonderful legacy they have. So if you're looking for a boring traditional museum tour, Roosevelt Park is not the place for you. But if you're looking to have fun and learn a lot, this is the place for you. And I'm just going to quickly go through some slides here that show you the uh, type of uh, participatory interactions you can have when you come to the park. So uh, I should point out, we have spectacular uh, hike, hiking trails. The park has over 2,800 acres of uh, natural area and hiking trails, uh, spectacular ocean scenery on both sides of the island. And uh, we have instituted over the past three years, two new experiences, two guided hikes. So our park naturalists will take you on an hour journey um, and we can do uh, easy walks, moderate hikes and, and quite difficult hikes. And uh, you kind of customize your experience and uh, those are available daily at the park. Uh, the park also has a lighthouse. And uh, I know many of you as proud Mainers, you know the appeal of a lighthouse. It's called Mulholland Point Lighthouse, and it looks directly across at uh, Lubeck, Maine. And uh, here we have a small uh, red shed, you can see it right there, uh, where we do a lot of marine mammal interpretation. So we partner with the uh, famous uh, uh, Canadian Institute of uh, Right Whales and the uh, and the uh, New England Aquarium. And uh, we run a little marine interpretive shed uh, there where we have a park naturalist who will uh, interpret all of the uh, aquatic, uh, aquatic culture of uh, Passamaquoddy Bay. Again, just a, a beautiful spot. If you're looking for a nice hike uh, or a splendid sail, this is on the backside of the island. We're looking across at uh, Grand Manan, which is uh, uh, one of our sister islands. So uh, the Fundy Isles, there are three famous Fundy Islands, Deer Island, Campobello, and Grand Manan. This is our sister island, Grand Manan. So Franklin and Eleanor would have sailed across to Grand Manan many times. Uh, just a beautiful, beautiful island. And of course, we have, uh, I think, four observation sites throughout the park. And as I mentioned, we can take you on guided hikes right to these observation sites. And this um, is on top of Friar's Head, and it's looking out uh, across Passamaquoddy Bay. And this actually, to your left in this picture, you'll see a small islet, just to the left there. And uh, I guess your, your right, my left. And uh, this is a site in the 1930s, what was going to be one of the biggest works projects. Uh, Franklin and uh, some folks, uh, decided they were going to dam Passamaquoddy Bay and produce hydroelectric power. This became one of the most costly projects. It had just begun when the Republican Congress uh, put it in, put it down. They uh, voted it down and it wasn't able to proceed, but it was an ambitious project and we, we sometimes wonder if, th if that would be producing most of the power for Downey's Maine uh, if it had gone forward. And I highly encourage anyone who's interested in Roosevelt history to look into the famous Quaddy Dam project. It's, it's uh, quite, quite interesting. And of course, we have all sorts of wonderful uh, leisure activities on the front lawn of the park. This year, um, before the pandemic came, we were, uh, we were going to uh, offer a play that was going to take place right in Roosevelt Cottage. And it would tell the history of uh, many of the household staff that had worked there. And uh, so we're excited, we're probably gonna roll that out in 2021. Uh, this season as well, we were going to uh, produce a number of evening programs that were gonna take place at the cottage and 
Uh, so you should definitely look forward to those in 2021. And we, we certainly welcome everyone here to come to the park and we'll be more than happy to look after you. Uh, we offer uh, uh, guided tours of the cottage. They take place every 15 minutes and uh, our interpreters are extremely well trained. We work very carefully with them in terms of uh, interpreting history and many different styles. Uh, here, this is one of our French language interpreters, Gerard Bork, uh, delivering a tour of the living room. And of course, uh, you might wonder what is an international park? Uh, Roosevelt Campobello International Park is uh, formed by an act of legislation in both countries. So uh, in the United States and in Canada, there's a commission Six commissioners are appointed by the president, six by the prime minister, and uh, the Roosevelt family is still very active uh, on the commission. In fact, we have two grandchildren that uh, sit on the commission and uh, help govern the uh, park. And we're jointly funded um, by both countries and formed by an international treaty. So the park sits entirely on Canadian soil, but we share American presidential history with predominantly Americans. The uh, visitation to the park is 80% American and 20% Canadian. So uh, I can uh, very shortly begin the uh, tea with uh, Eleanor uh, video of my guide sharing their stories. But before we do that, I went rather quickly through those slides. Are, are there any questions? Thank you Thank for, you such, for a great such a great presentation. presentation. I'm wondering, it has so much to recommend it. Did FDR have much pushback from uh, people in the States that he kept going to Canada while he was president? Not at all. Not at all. We, uh, I think he shared uh, just a warm relationship with uh, most of the Islanders and uh, I think a lot of uh, Americans just naturally assume that Campobello is American anyway. Uh, I think Chuck is say, uh, saying a question, but I can't hear it. Yeah, I can't either. Chuck is still muted. Yeah, Chuck, Chuck are you muted? Unmute. I. There you go. Can you ask your question again? Yeah. Okay. You can hear me now because my icon says mute. So anyway, uh, I'm interested in the original name for the island. You say it was settled by by uh, Welsh, but the the name to me sounds Spanish. It, it translates as uh, beautiful country, beautiful land. Yeah, actually. So I wondered where that, where the name originally came from. Yeah, actually, it's it's a bit of a pun. Uh, there's a bit of a story to that. It's actually pigeon Italian. Uh, Campo bello. Let me hear you say it. Come on, Campo bello. Bello. Nice. Very good. Um, William Campbell is gifted the island. Uh, there's a something we call a lieutenant governor of the Maritimes. And for his military service uh, in the late 1700s, early 1800s, he's gifted Campobello. And very wisely, he names it after his senior officer, uh, Campbell. And so he kind of uh, creates a pun on the name. And that's how we get Camp Campobello, William Campbell. Any I other have a question? question. Yeah. Um, I think it's 1922 that he came down with polio and he uh, had gone for a swim. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Sure, absolutely. Uh, Franklin attends a Boy Scout rally. Um, and I'm not sure of the actual park in New York State. Fair Mountain State Fair Park. Fair Mountain. Fair Mountain, thank you. Yep. And uh, we believe that he contracts the, the virus there. And then he heads to Campobello and he begins a summer vacation. Uh, on the day that he began to experience the symptoms, 
he went for a sail with his children and he, he actually sees a small forest fire on one of the islands that I was showing you. And he, uh, with the children, they pull up their sailboat, they put out the forest fire, they get back in the sailboat, they sail back to Roosevelt Cottage. They run down a long road called Glen Severn Road. Uh, it's about two kilometers. They run down this road to, uh, it's like a brackish little pond uh, that the locals call root beer pond. So you can imagine the color of the water. And he goes for a swim in root beer pond, as they often did. He races the children back down to Roosevelt Cottage with another two kilometers. And he walks in the front door and it's time for dinner. And he says to Eleanor, I'm not feeling that well, I'm gonna go upstairs. And that's when he first begins to feel the symptoms of polio. That's when they begin to manifest themselves. Thank you for your question, good question. Anybody Any other else? questions? Okay, would we like to see the uh, video of tea with Eleanor? Go ahead. Go ahead All right, well, we're set, we'll set that up for you. Great, thank you. Okay. Anna Eleanor Roosevelt was born in 1884 on October 11th. She was born into a family of wealth and prominence. Her mother, Anna Hall, was a great beauty of her day. And Elliot Roosevelt, her father, was actually the brother to Theodore Roosevelt, who a little bit later on would be the president of the United States. Things looked like they'd be pretty good for Eleanor. But her mother judged her very harshly on her plain looks and on her naturally anxious personality. So she didn't really have a bond with her mom. Her mother would actually call her Granny. And Eleanor said when she'd hear that nickname, she would feel like sinking into the floor with shame. Now, Elliot Roosevelt, her father, adored Eleanor. He would call her his little now. And Eleanor actually adored her father. She would high, hold him in high regard. But Elliot had a lot of problems. He suffered with some mental illness and addiction problems. So he was not a constant in Eleanor's life. At age 10, Eleanor would be an orphan. Her and her two younger brothers were sent to Tivoli, New York to live with Grandmother Hall. When I heard that they were moving to a grandmother's, I thought, well, this is great. You think of warm hugs and cookies from a grandmother. That's not how it was in Tivoli with Grandmother Hall. Grandmother Hall was very stern, very strict. But at age 15, Eleanor's life is gonna take a turn for the better. She is sent to an all-girls private school in England, and it's there that she finally receives the love and affection that she so wanted. The children, her own age, loved her. The girls thought she was awesome. She actually joined a field hockey team. That was the first time she'd ever been a part of anything like that. She was actually the captain. But it was her relationship with Madame Sylvestre that will actually form and shape the woman that we talk about today. Madame Sylvestre was a very liberal-minded, socially conscious intellect, and she would share those ideas with Eleanor. She would actually try to get her students to think for themselves. Eleanor Roosevelt said everything that she became had its seeds sown in the three years at Allenswood. But after three years, it's time to go back to the United States. Eleanor has to make her debut in society. That wasn't anything she wanted to do. She actually would say herself it was sheer and utter agony. But she did that. And um, being a debutante, she was allowed to join the Junior League. And she would work for the Junior League tirelessly. She actually would help teach dance and calisthenics to the immigrant children in the tenement homes. Around this time, she was seeing a new beau, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now, Franklin was her fifth cousin once removed. One time when she was teaching her classes, a little girl fell ill. Franklin was there visiting Eleanor and helped take the little girl home. He said he would never be able to get out of his mind the things that he saw and smelled that day. He could not believe that people lived that way. He was horrified. So, you know, way back then, I feel Eleanor was opening Franklin's eyes to how the other half was living. In 1905, March 17th, Franklin and Eleanor were married in New York City. Uncle Teddy is going to give the bride away. He was, uh, you know, Franklin really looked up to Teddy and he loved Eleanor. She was actually 
um, his favorite niece, he would say. And, um, you know, Teddy loved the spotlight. So he kind of stole the show at Eleanor's wedding. Alice Longsworth Roosevelt, Teddy's daughter, would say of her father that he wanted to be the bride at every wedding, the baby at every christening, and the corpse at every funeral. So she wasn't even the star of her own wedding. The Roosevelts would have six children. They lost a little boy in infancy due to influenza, which was a horrible blow to her. And, you know, their fifth child, Franklin Jr., was actually born in the upstairs bedroom of the cottage on Camp Bella. Um, you know, in 1912, Franklin's career would start to take off. He was elected to the New York Senate. He also would hire a newspaper man from Albany, New York, named Louis Howe. Louis Howe would be um, a political advisor for Franklin, but also would become a very big ally for Eleanor Roosevelt and a good friend of the family. 1913 would find him appointed the assistant secretary to the Navy. Eleanor and the family are going to have to move to Washington. It's here that Eleanor is going to have to don the white gloves and start making social calls. Um, nothing that she wanted to do, actually. She would only allow six minutes for each social call. And if they didn't answer their doorbell, well, she would head on to the next. The things that are going to bring her contentment and joy is being useful. She would try to be useful to her mother way back when she was under the age of 10. And this were the things that brought her joy. She would work tirelessly in the canteens for the Red Cross. She would work three days a week in these canteens, rising at five o'clock in the morning and not getting home till nine o'clock at night most nights. She would also lend her time one day a week for the Navy League. And also she would work two days a week visiting St. Elizabeth's Hospital for the mentally ill World War I vets. She said that was terrifying, but she would do it anyway. You must do the thing you think you cannot do. She would continue to live by that her whole life. So her work with the Red Cross uh, was quite important to her. Now we're gonna jump up to 1921. Franklin uh, falls ill with polio. He actually falls ill right in that same bedroom that little Franklin Jr. was born in. Eleanor takes over being his nurse. She took care of Franklin. But even more importantly than that, it is Eleanor and Louis Howe that encouraged Franklin to continue into politics. They both felt that if he laid there and think of all the things that he couldn't do because he was paralyzed from the waist down, that would be the end of him. And what a mind to waste. So they encourage him and they also keep his name in the political arena. 1928, Franklin is elected the governor of New York. 1930, re-elected. 1932, the 32nd president of the United States is elected and Eleanor has a brand new job. This is not a job she ever wanted. She's gonna take this role and take it to the people. She's actually Franklin's legs. So Eleanor is the one that's torn the United States and knows what is happening. Franklin actually believes everything that she says. So when she's collecting information, bringing it back to Franklin, he knows it's true. Franklin was the first president to have press conferences. And he had some rules at his press conferences, no females allowed. Eleanor Roosevelt decided she'd have her own press conferences with only female reporters permitted. That would leave the newspapermen scrambling to hire 12 female reporters. These reporters would stay with Eleanor her whole time in the White House. Hi, my name is Sherry Mitchell and I work at the Roosevelt Campobello International Park. And today I'd like to share a few little stories about Eleanor Roosevelt and her fight for civil rights. In 1939, Eleanor and her friend, Mary Cloud Bethune, are going to take a trip to Birmingham, Alabama. They are going to the first Southern Conference on Human Welfare. Once they get to the auditorium, they are met outside by police officers. The police says to Eleanor, when you go inside the hall, you cannot sit with your friend. This is a segregated hall. Now, Eleanor never said a word. They went inside. She goes to the white side of the hall. She picks up a folding chair. She brings it back to the center of the hall, and that is where she sat during the whole conference. Eleanor didn't have to say a word. Her actions spoke volumes. Eleanor was saying, I cannot sit with my friend. 
I will not uphold segregation. And I have a picture here, Mary, Mary McLeod Bethune and Eleanor Roosevelt. Now, just a few weeks after this, uh, Marian Anderson, a beautiful contralto singer who is already famous in Europe, wants to sing at Constitution Hall. Now, the Daughters of the American Revolution, they deny her request, said that only white performers were allowed to perform at Constitution Hall. Helen heard about this and she actually resigns from the Daughters of the American Revolution. She said she felt bad because her ancestors did fight in the Revolutionary War, but she did not agree with segregation. So Eleanor gets busy, like she does with everything else, and she helps set up a concert on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial for Easter Sunday, 1939, for Marion to perform at. There was over 75,000 people that showed up that day to listen to Marion sing, and over a million listened to her on the radio. There was one lady that did not show up that day, and that was Eleanor. She said that she was afraid if she went, she would be afraid that people would want to know what she was up to being First Lady, and she didn't want to take anything away from uh, Marion Anderson. I have a little book here with Marion Anderson, and it's about her life and about how her, she starts her career. Now, three years before this uh, concert, Franklin and Eleanor actually did have her over at the White House. She performed for them, and they also invited her back when the King and Queen of England visited the White House to perform for them. Now, in 1941, in uh, Tuskegee, Alabama, there is a school down there that is teaching men to fly. There is a group of African American men who want to fight for the country, and they want to do it in flight. Now, people back then were saying, African American men cannot fly. They cannot even learn to fly. Eleanor heard about this, so what does she do? She takes a little trip to Tuskegee. She wants to find out what's happening. On the way down, the Secret Service said to Eleanor, once we get down there, we have a white pilot all picked up for you to go up with. Eleanor didn't say anything. Once she got there, she went through the line of pilots, shaking each and every hand, whites and African American. She stopped at one African American pilot, and she said, can you take me up? His name is C. Alfred Anderson. Are you gonna say no to the first lady? So he takes her up, they fly around for over an hour. Now, can you just imagine what the Secret Service was thinking the whole time they were up there? Once they landed, Eleanor had one short statement for him. She said, you certainly can fly. Now, she heads back to Washington and she prods her husband for funding. The funding is found. These men learn to fly and they become some of the most sought after pilots during the war. Now they paint their tails and their nose cones red so that they're easily recognized. And they escort over two thirds of our bombers during the war. And they actually hold the record for losing the least of bombers of any other squadron. Now I have a little picture of Eleanor in the biplane with C. Alfred Anderson. There she is right there, proud lady. Now in 1958, Eleanor is invited to the Highlander Folk School to give us a talk on civil rights. Now remember, this is 1958. And the KKK actually put a 25,000 bounty on her head. So the FBI tell Eleanor, you cannot go down there. And she said, I'm going. And they're like, remember, you're not the first lady anymore. You will not have an escort. She said, I'm going anyway. What do you suppose she does? She gets her bodyguard, Earl Miller, to teach her how to shoot. She gets a pistol and off she goes. She drives through miles of country roads to get to the Highlander School. Once she gets there, she stands on the front porch and delivers a 45 minute workshop on civil rights. Now, Eleanor said she was really glad that nothing happened that day because even though she had her pistol, she was glad she didn't have to use it because she was not a very good shot. <laughs> 
Hi, I'm Jocelyn Calder, and today I'm going to share with you some of Eleanor's time here on Campanello and why tea was so important to her. Eleanor would receive this red cottage from her mother-in-law as a belated wedding present. It was the first home that she ever felt was her own. So she took the time in rearranging the furniture and decorating. But more importantly, Eleanor Roosevelt would fill it with people. People from the high society that would summer here, but even the locals. Oftentimes she would invite in the local hookers and strippers for a cup of tea, to which then she would buy their hooked and braided rugs to decorate her cottage with. Eleanor may have been from high society, but she was also very down to earth. While she was here, she attended many local dances, whom she danced with whoever would ask her. She just simply loved to dance. But one night she was wearing a particularly lovely dress. When one of the local ladies started gushing over the dress that Eleanor was wearing, Eleanor looked at her and smiled and said, Sears and Roebuck. That would basically be our equivalent to saying, gee, thanks, Walmart special. The same library that years before Eleanor had participated in a play where she was a willow tree was now the scene of a crime. The year was 1946. Eleanor was here for the dedication of a plaque in her late husband's honor. But the problem was, Falla, his beloved Scottish terrier, had been stolen. It was actually a young boy that, during the day's events, was so intrigued by the posh little dog that he brought it home so that his sister could see it. After hours of playing with the dog, his mother realized whose dog he was actually playing with and um, forced him to come back here to the Red Cottage, where he had to sheepishly knock on the door and return the dog to none other than Eleanor Roosevelt, first lady of the world herself. It is here that I think Eleanor shows her great grace and compassion towards people, because what she did was she thanked the young boy for giving the dog such a grand adventure and for returning him home safely. Tea time was Eleanor Roosevelt's happy hour. That's when she would get together with her friends, they would sit down, they'd have a cup of tea, discuss things, make connections, talk about what mattered most to them, what was going on in their lives, and share ideas. Here on Campanello Island, it was always at three o'clock. Whether it was out here on a beautiful beach, out on Franklin's boat, enjoying the seas, or just at the cottage. What mattered most is that it was people taking time out of their day to just be with each other. While Assistant Secretary of the Navy's wife in Washington, Eleanor turned her tea time into a time that the ladies around Washington could come into her home where she would provide them with the knitting needles and the yarn if need be so that they could help with the war effort. Probably my favorite tea that Eleanor ever held was actually in the White House. It would be her final tea after FDR's death. She had spent 12 years and 40 days being the First Lady. And yet for her final tea, she would invite 12 female reporters, the very ones who had been hired to cover her press conferences. At this point, she had wined and dined with world leaders, Nobel Prize winners, and some of the most powerful people. Yet it was to honor those women who had spent their times writing the headlines, but never in them. I think what I love most about her time here on Campobello Island and the teas is that it really shows who she was as a person. And in the end, Eleanor Roosevelt's life was all about people. Hi there, I'm Mitch Jade Robbins joining you to share with you some of my favorite Eleanor Roosevelt stories, which actually holds the story of what Eleanor Roosevelt would call her single greatest accomplishment. I often wonder, how did she pick? Um, but the story starts in 1945, FDR passes away, Eleanor Roosevelt is asked where she's headed to next, what causes she's going to stand up for next. Um, she replied, the story is written. Um, she was going to probably retire and spend some time with family, but it wasn't too long after she made that statement that Harry Truman appointed her to be a delegate for the United Nations. He put her on the Committee of Equality. She thought at the time it was because the, it was the least active committee and she could probably do no harm there. I think a great word to describe Eleanor Roosevelt is modest because even after all she had achieved this far in her life, she still didn't quite see her worth.
Um, but by the time Eleanor Roosevelt was done there, it was the most active committee. She was set to be the chairperson to form, delegate, and sign the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Freedoms. And I think what not a better person than Eleanor Roosevelt to lead that. She worked tirelessly on this document. 85 grueling sessions to which at one point one delegate stood up and said, um, Mrs. Roosevelt, we too have human rights. To which she said, if you want shorter sessions, perhaps you should make shorter speeches. She was pretty ruthless in her time at the UN. Until finally, on December 10th, 1948, at 3 o'clock in the morning, all of the delegates rose with a standing ovation and applause that some say was almost deafening for the works of one woman, Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt took small steps her entire life for human equality, rights, and freedom, and finally, with the moral backing of 58 nations, it was put into a document for a more free and equal world. So I think of that as Eleanor Roosevelt's single greatest achievement, where the document is still affecting us all, even today, that speaks volumes for the type of person Eleanor Roosevelt was. Now, in the light of social distancing and isolation, and we can't be there with you today, and you can't be here with us, I've decided to take you somewhere very special today, um, so let's go check that out. We're at Mahalan Point Lighthouse on Campobello where you can get a great look at the FDR Memorial Bridge. So let's go see that out. This was FDR and Eleanor's beloved island. Um, in 1962, it's a big day for us islanders. We are getting this bridge um, that finally connects us to the mainland, um, United States. Um, at this point in time, there was only one car car ferry that would take you from Lubet and bring you over to Campobello. So we were all, most of us were pretty excited about this. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt's friend of the island invited her down to do the dedication of the book in her husband's name. Eleanor Roosevelt was 78 years old. Her health was declining. He initially denied this request. But as the date grew near, she simply could not um, pass this opportunity up. So she packed up her doctor, David Gurich. They make the long trek um, to Campobello when she's over in Lubeck, waiting for the car ferry to pick her up. When a worker on the bridge knocks on the window and notices it's Mrs. Roosevelt and says, how would you like to be the very first civilian to cross the bridge in honor of your husband? So she was the very first person to cross the bridge. You can't make history up that good. Um, while she was here, she wrote in her My Day column, I feel as though I am on the mend. As Islanders, we'd like to think that it was the sea salt, breezy air. Um, but what she was really doing was having tea with all of her friends of the island. She said she couldn't believe how elderly they were all getting. I guess she wasn't aging a bit. Um, but unfortunately, that wasn't entirely the case because when Eleanor Roosevelt went back to New York on November 7th of that same year, she passed away peacefully in her sleep with her friends and family by her side. Aplastic anemia was the official cause of death. Likely, um, she picked up tuberculosis early on. <clears throat> now, friends, I think that was a lot well lived. I can only imagine Eleanor Roosevelt touched the lives of so many people what her funeral looked like. Um, it was standing room only. People just like you or I were there, past, sitting, and future presidents were there. Marian Anderson was there. Adelaide Stevenson gave her eulogy to which he said some of the most beautiful words about her I've ever heard. Eleanor Roosevelt would rather, rather light candles in her world. Now I hope um, you enjoyed this tea with us. I hope that you learned a few things and maybe she inspired you a little bit to get out there and do something kind for someone. And hopefully um, this talk has inspired you in this beautiful site to hopefully work social distancing and quarantine as a thing of the past. To get down to Campobello and hopefully see the same beauty and significance that Eleanor, Franklin, and myself, and I think all Islanders see in our little island. So when um, this part of the history is all said and done, I hope to see you all real soon. Um, thank you very much. Ooh. Wow. Thanks, Well, That was amazing. Thank you. So that's just a little taste of... Uh, our Tea with Eleanor program. Road trip, road trip.
I'm happy to, I'm not sure how much time we have, Mike, but I'm happy to try and answer any questions. Uh, at questions. This time. That'd be great, yeah. Anybody have any questions? Yep. Uh, Anyone? The Pr Priscilla? Priscilla, go ahead, Priscilla. Can you give me a, a history of the Roosevelt wealth? <laughs> <laughs> Can I give you a history of the Roosevelt wealth? Was that the question? Yes. No, I can't do that. Why would I do that? I can tell. I can tell you that. Um, I can't. I can't speak to uh, where James uh, earned his money. Uh, suffice to say that I believe uh, he was engaged in the China trade, and uh, he was. Um, on the board of many different banks. I think he dabbled in steel. Railroads, yep. Uh, but it's not my uh, forte. I, you know, I, I focus pretty much on their history on Campobello Island. But, um, and the Delanos, I believe, had a very similar history to the Roosevelt's in terms of uh, obtaining their wealth. But perhaps Mike might be better to uh, just speak. Yeah, no, you're, not, you're spot on, yeah. So. yeah. I can tell you very quickly I, now, I've not confirmed this, and I read it in a book, uh, that Franklin, uh, even when he was president, had an allowance yeah. from his mother. His mother controlled his first springs till the day she died. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Mama. And that's probably how he kept as well. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. Mike? Yeah. Go ahead. Hey, Gary Crocker. Now, first of all, thank you for that wonderful presentation. That was great. I, I rode uh, with some friends on a motorcycle over to Camp Fellow last summer and had a wonderful visit, and they did a great talk. Uh, we took the tour of the house and saw the film. Uh, and what impressed me was the quality of everything. And the question I have for you is, how do you possibly maintain that and make it free to the public? Excellent. That's a great question, and thank you very much for your kind um, comment. We um, have an operation staff who are incredible, and they work incredibly hard. We we actually, I'm sure you saw the flowers uh, when you were there in the many gardens, and we um, have two gardeners on staff, and uh, basically we are funded by both governments uh, equally. Uh, and basically how it has anyone worked for a government before <laughs> yeah try working for two <laughs> friends <laughs> it's it's actually a wonderful place to work we're treated exceptionally well and we're very well funded and um, the operations staff is Cracker Jack and we uh, we consider um, not the, just the cottage but also the environs to be our greatest artifact. So I don't know how, how much about museum policy many of you know, but in our collections policy, it is written that the environs are actually an artifact. So we give them the utmost of attention and care, just as we do Roosevelt Cottage and uh, all the other cottages. And uh, it's just an incredible organization and. I'm, I'm very lucky to work there, and uh, I'm glad that you had a good experience, and we hope that you come back. We will. Mike? Yeah. I think... Yeah, road trip. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think Priscilla has been trying to Priscilla, ask... Priscilla, you a question? I have a question. Uh -oh. Hang on. Priscilla's been trying. Priscilla, you're muted. Let me unmute Priscilla okay. here. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Well, go ahead, Ruth, while I unmute Priscilla. Okay, I just would like to recommend this whole uh, trip because our uh, hiking group, which we call ourselves the S&M Hiking Club, nice. which means slow but moving. And we've been up to Campobello several times and on all the hiking trails we've been in, and they have a lovely cafeteria there too also. I think we had some lunch. Uh, at a wonderful place. Um, 
and we just enjoyed the the history of it um, so much as well as and there's a campground up on the island too i believe isn't there no, or am i thinking of of uh grand manan no that's that's right uh it's called herring cove provincial yes. park yes yeah, and so there's some lovely bed and breakfasts also yep, that you can have. stay in so you Beautiful. can just spend some time there we saw whales off the the uh, uh, the eastern coast um, where that lighthouse is. We hiked across there and came back before we got uh, marooned. So anyway, I just would recommend it. Excellent. Yep, it's a, a beautiful spot. Anybody else? Priscilla, are you still muted, Priscilla? I think so, am I? No, there you go. Okay, you're good. Go ahead. Hey, uh, a little bit about the children. You know, like we talked a lot about, you know, her and Franklin, but there were five, you know, a lot of children there. And a little bit about that, is there, I don't know. Sure, yeah, no problem, I, I can help you out. Um, difficult childhood, uh, being uh, children of the president, as you can imagine. Right. But at this time, when they're on Campobello, he's not okay. yet president. And okay. so they, they have their father all to themselves. He's a very okay. active uh, father. He obviously teaches them all how to sail, fish, hunt, uh, hike, play tennis, play golf. And I'll give you a couple of stories. The out in front of uh, Roosevelt Cottage is where the locals would let their sheep graze. Okay. And FDR Jr. Uh, steals one of the neighbor's uh, clothesline and he lassoes the sheep. And this is my favorite. If you work in the Roosevelt historical industry, you end up with a famous Roosevelt quote. Here's my fa favorite Roosevelt quote. It's from FDR Jr. He steals a clothesline, he lassoes the sheep, and he says, quote, that was the day I learned sheep could bite. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Friar's Head is a famous hike, and we saw part of it. Okay. And uh, Eleanor has a brother, and his name is Hall. And Hall and his college pals want to climb Friar's Head, which is a large rock outcropping, and you can only get to it at low tide. So uh, they go out there, and, they, and Franklin convinces them. I told you he was a prankster. He convinces them that he has climbed it, which he hasn't. And Hall and his college pals stand on each other's shoulders to try and get to the top. Well, they fall and they break their ankles and they break their arms. And uh, Franklin and Eleanor have to jump in a sailboat, sail over to the rock outcropping, pick them up, put them in the boat, and then keep sailing to Lubeck, Maine, where they drop them off at the doctor's. Oh, so there were all, all sorts of cottage shenanigans uh, yeah. with the children that I could, I could share with you. So That's cool. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Anybody else? I have a question. Once uh, FDR became president, did he go back to Campobello ever? Yes. Yeah, very famously, after his first 100 days in office, he sails up the coast with his family to Campobello in 1933. He returns in 1936, and again in 1939. Mm -hmm. So he, uh, he returns three times. Eleanor returns right up until a month before her death in 1962. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. um, how, much, how much interaction was there between the Roosevelt family and the local Native people, Canadians? Great. Uh, extensive. Uh, so the Islanders, uh, you know, were employed by the Roosevelts and, um, you know, would sell them fish and bring them ice and bring them food and pick berries and sell them berries and, uh, you know, worked uh, in the cottage. Uh, one of them, uh, three generations of uh, women, uh, worked as their housekeepers and cooks and eventually uh, started going to Hyde Park in the winters with the family. So extensive. And, uh, you know, you have to remember Franklin 
started to come to Campobello at the year, uh, one year of age, mm -hmm. uh, right up until he was president, he mm -hmm. would uh, visit Campobello. Now, later, after polio, uh, it became very difficult for him to be on Campobello because many people, he never spoke about it, but FBR Jr. spoke about it, and James Roosevelt, his eldest son, spoke about it. And that was, it seemed to remind him of a life that he no longer had, this okay. active life uh, where he was a young father. And it was very difficult for him to be on Campobello. A lot of people uh, have written about that in various books, but I, I believe that to be true. I, I think one needs only to look at the photographs um, of the 1920s and uh, you can see how much it meant to him. So I'm told uh, late in life, in the late 19, uh, it, uh, towards the end of his time in the White House, he would call reporters together and he would reminisce about his time on Campobello. And uh, so I think late, late in life, as he, would, as he kind of knew he was pretty sick and coming towards the end, he, he reminisced about his time on Campobello and just how much that meant to him, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. That's cool. Okay. Thank you. I always feel like the teacher in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> We've been there twice, but you make us want to go again. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You know, I, I, I'll tell you, we were going to do this really cool program this season. And we'll, we'll save it for 2021, but we, you were going to be able to come and go out on a lobster boat. Now, you remember Anna from the video? Uh, mm -hmm. Her husband is a lobsterman, and he was going to take you out on the boat, and you'd be able to pull a trap, and they would teach you everything about lobster, and then we'd come back, and on the back deck of the cottage, we were going to have a, a good old-fashioned lobster boil, and we would sing sea shanties, and we'd have a few uh, beverages. I assume those sea <laughs> shanties would be PG-rated, Will? Oh, no. No, no. <laughs> My dad was in the Navy for five years. The oh, sea shanties he knows are not clean. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we, like be, we like to be historically accurate. <laughs> Put my game on this for 2021. I'm sorry? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, we may have to organize a, a, a trip up there. If not a bunch of us, then at least I would encourage everyone to head up when all this stuff is done. It's only a few hours away. Um, but I think it'd be, it's a place well worth your time. So, yeah, certainly a few uh, hours, just a few hours in main, in main speak. It's just a few hours. <laughs> I mean, I know you drive five hours from here. You're in New York city, you go the other way, but five hours from here, North, you, you, you get to Camp of Bella. So okay. beautiful drive. Too. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you, Will, for the time you took to put this together. Thank you, the Internet gods of uh, New Brunswick, for making sure there was no problems. Thank your staff for us. That was absolutely a, a kick in the pants and a real treat to have them take the time to make sure we did this. Um, and I'm just, I, I appreciate your time. It's, it's touching to have you take the time to do this for us, and we certainly appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. It's been wonderful uh, to spend some time with you all. and. Uh, you know, don't worry about anything. We're going to get through this uh, time. Uh, if you learn anything with the Roosevelts, it's that you just have to keep going one foot yep. in front of the other yep. and uh, good things will happen. So th thank thank you for your time and I look forward to seeing you all on Campobello. You all can all buy me a drink. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. Thank you. Very good. Very much. Friday class, we'll see you Friday morning. Monday class, we'll see you next week. Okay. Yep. Be good. Be safe. And as Gary Crocker says, be kind to each other. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank right, you. Guys, be good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.